Men in those days believed the women should be at home. Take care of the wife, take care of the children, and when they come home, keep the house, put an apron on, have babies, you know. And so that's the way it was. And you know, a lot of homes in those days, the man was in charge. I mean, a woman never had anything to say or do or organize. There were a lot of women who did not mind staying in the background. They didn't, they didn't mind that. They felt that, well, the man was supposed to lead and, and they to follow. The women got their strength by the man not being there, the absence of the man. Remember, it was the time of the project. Men went away, their wives were left in charge to be in charge of the households, and so they, they, they evolved, they developed their God-given potential as being in charge in the absence of the Father. The women began to realize that it was not a before and a behind situation, it was a side-by-side -side situation. And I believe that was when they began to, the, 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 the woman in them began to wake up and they began to realize, well look, I mean, God had a place he went out for me from the foundation and, and I've got to get into my rightful place. And that was when they decided, well, if you're going to get anywhere, you're going to have to fight. And that was when the fight started. The women who were really in the forefront of this movement were not for the main, in the main college graduates. They were women who were housewives, women who had um, in fact worked with foreign persons and who had some exposure overseas and then came back um, having had this exposure and coming back at the time and everything was like falling into place. Remember, because in 1929, women in the United States got the vote for the first time. And so they were coming back with all of this and being fired about uh, what is possible and how women were being recognized worldwide. They felt that, you know, this is something we, we should have it. There's no reason why we should not have it. And if there is a way that we could get it, let's go and help this movement that can help us to give us the What's the word? To give us that right to be equal with our men and to have a say in our country, because we want to have a say. And then they came together and you had all of these, um, uh, not sororities, but fraternities. You had like the Elves, you had the Good Samaritans, the Order of the Eastern Star, and all of those other nations. And from that group, there came the tribe to have women recognized and to have women given the right to vote. The women concerned were diverse. Mary Ingram was a housewife uh, who had helped her husband in her business. He represented Auckland's and Crooked Island 47 48, 1947 and 48. Um, and in the election, I think, of 48, he lost his seat. And on his return, from campaigning and after the election, he made the remark, May, if women could have voted, I would have won. They discussed everything. And all her, her reply was, you believe that? And he said, yes, because I believe the women would have put me in. <laughs> and that was, to me, the remark that sparked the whole incident. Mabel Walker came to the Bahamas, the young bride of Dr. Walker. Now, Mabel Walker had been in, involved, she was a social worker before she came to the Bahamas. And um, Mabel Walker was a college graduate. Virginia Lockhart was a woman who had maybe 12 children. And she used to sew. She could make all sorts of things, and in, in, including doing some straw work, but her business was sewing. And um, she had her children to help her. My mother was semi-housewife, but she was keeping the, the store. We had a store on Mackey Street and one on the Market Wharf. And she would manage the one on Mackey Street. They used to go on their bicycles, pedaling all around, trying to get women to sign the petition for the right to vote. But as it evolved more, and we found that 
there were some obstacles in the way and these for the greater part these were the power that be were men who were then UBP supporters and they felt like this would give women too much leverage. The movement got started out of the minority group at the time who realized if we had women voting for us, it would have made a difference in some of our constituencies. And so the start was from that. Both parties began to realize, you know what, our numbers can look a whole lot better if we had more women voting. And so yeah, it was a happy combination. When you add, when you add the whole business of women can vote to the whole business of black people can lead, that's a, that's a heady combination, you know. Mary Ingram was not a member of the PLP. Mary Ingram was looking for the, the women's right to vote. Mary Ingram was championing the, the rights of women. And so was Mabel Walker. But these women had no motive other than securing an equality of status for men and women. Dr. Johnson. Doris Johnson. She was the exception. I got the impression, and she certainly didn't um, disabuse anybody of that impression, that she herself was interested in political office and could see herself as a member of um, the Bahamian government, which she eventually did become. But unfortunately, she was never actually elected to the House of Assembly, although she ran for the House. There was no position of leader in the women's suffrage movement's constitution. But they made room for it and gave her that position because they wanted her to, to do the speaking, especially that in public. You know, if you're and if you're going to talk to somebody of some importance, you need to be able to put your ideas over very quickly, succinctly, and positively. And that's the role that Doris could play, and play it very well. That was Doris's strength. When this woman talked, they couldn't say, She's talking foolishness. They couldn't say to her, go back in the kitchen where you belong. This woman had gone to some of the best universities in the world. Intelligent, as I said, with all these degrees. So it was her credibility as an educated woman. That, that you know, and, and of course her personal commitment that made her what she was. And singled her out amongst all of them and made her the spokeswoman, so to speak. I remember uh, the morning when the word came over. Doris Johnson has asked to petition the house and they're coming over to the, to the court. And I ran out on the, uh, on the porch and watched the members of the House of Assembly walking across. And I remember seeing Doris Johnson and a number of these other people who were there. Doris Johnson made that speech in January of 1959. And in January, no, yeah, in January, two years later, um, so staff of science reported um, a, a bill from the Constitution Committee giving uh, women in the Bahamas the right to to vote, and um, I suppose I, I don't, we had decided in the UBB parliamentary to do it, certainly for the 62 election. They were able to vote. It had been passed, it had been to England, and now we were entitled to. Here am I at this very propitious time in history. And I'm there, I'm, I'm in place. I must make history on behalf of the women that it all started. There was an excitement on the inside of me that you must do it on behalf of these women. At that time, in uh, November of 62, we had our first little girl, um, Margot. She was born in May of 62. I felt that I was doing this for her and for the rest of the young Bahamians. I, it was, I was putting it there, that mark of Margot, my daughter. 
and that it was that she was going to grow up in the Bahamas where she was totally accepted, where the sky was a limit and that I was doing something to ensure that.